welcome back in this series this is the second lecture which is going to talk about the odontogenic cysts in the last presentation you saw that the cysts can be basically divided as developmental and inflammatory based on the cell of origin it can be either odontogenic or non odontogenic cysts which are derived from the inclusions of the facial processes based upon the stimulus you have inflammatory odontogenic cysts and developmental odontogenic cysts both can originate from either cell rest of malaceous cell rest of serrae or reduced enamel epithelium in today's lecture we will be talking about the cells of the reduced enamel epithelium and the cysts that derive from them the very first cyst that is derived from the reduced enamel epithelium and the most important one is the dentigerous cyst it is also called as the follicular cyst because it forms a small pouch like cavity around the crown of the tooth so as you can see in this particular picture you can see that there is a crown of the tooth and there is a cavity around the tooth now this particular cavity that is formed is mainly because of the fluid accumulation happening between the reduced enamel epithelium and the crown of the tooth so when you look at this particular tooth it is typically a cyst enclosing the crown of the tooth and it is very clearly attached at the neck of the tooth so if you observe the other picture you can see that the cyst is attached at the cemento enamel junction which is a characteristic feature of dentigerous cyst so let's have a look at the pathogenesis before we go into the typical pathogenesis let us understand how a particular tooth develops so let us say that you have a molar and in this particular tooth you have this is the root portion in this particular tooth you will have after the formation of the tooth by the epithelial apparatus you have the reduced enamel epithelium that very nicely coats around the cemento enamel junction but this is not a single cell layer this is a double cell layer you have the inner enamel epithelium and the outer enamel epithelium that is coating this now in this particular cyst you can have two types of fluid accumulation that can be noted you can either have fluid accumulation in this region where you have the crown and both the layers of the epithelium in the other area so you can have fluid accumulation between the epithelial component and the tooth or you can have fluid accumulation within the inner enamel epithelium and the outer enamel epithelium so the other type of accumulation of fluid which is more common is between the crown of the tooth and the epithelium so that is called as the intra follicular type of cyst formation so how does this separation take place the pressure that is exerted by an erupting tooth it presses the epithelial component and when this pressure is exerted the venous outflow in that particular region gets blocked and there is rapid transudation of the serum across the capillaries so that means that serum that comes out of the capillaries has to go and accumulate somewhere and it exerts so much of hydrostatic pressure that it causes separation of the follicle from the crown and the fluid starts accumulating because of the eruptive force and the obstruction of the venous outflow this leads to accumulation of the fluid apart from these you also have epithelial proliferation because of this pressure and maybe some inflammatory stimulus the epithelium starts to proliferate not only does the epithelium proliferate but it also causes some bone resorbing factors reduced enamel epithelial itself has the capability of resorbing bone and that is mainly because of the desmolytic property that it processes apart from these the increased osmolarity of the cystic fluid because of the increased concentration of the glycosaminoglycan passage of the inflammatory cells and the increased intracystic osmotic tension 
all three give rise to the expansion of the cyst. So overall, when you look at it, the whole cyst formation is initiated by the eruption of the tooth, which causes venous obstruction, leading to transudation of the serum and causes accumulation of the fluid between the tooth and the epithelial component. This stimulates the epithelium to proliferate, bone to resorb, and also it gives rise to increased osmolality of the cyst fluid because of increased concentration of glycosaminoglycans, passage of inflammatory cells and cellular debris, as well as increased in intracystic osmotic tension. So that gives rise to the cyst. How does it look like? Usually the cyst is generally seen as a swelling in relation to the crown. The tooth will be typically impacted, it will be unerupted. And when you have an unerupted tooth, you will have a small swelling in that region where it is going to erupt. Males seem to have a higher prevalence than females and peripheral flaps and expansion and pain may be noted. Typically, it is a very resorptive kind of lesion because of the property of the connective tissue which has the desmolytic property. So in this image, you can note that there is a impacted tooth and all around the impacted, the crown of the impacted tooth, you have radiolucency, which is resorbing the bone. It may be associated with enamel hypoplasia, mostly solitary, but uh, in certain cases like Maritolami syndrome and cleidocranial dysplasia, you have noted bilateral dentigerous cysts. If you note this image, you can see that there is another cyst in the opposite side also here. So bilateral cyst. Most commonly, they are associated with the maxillary and the mandibular third molars and the maxillary canines. It may be associated with any of the impacted teeth. Usually, the premolars are the next most common impacted teeth. Usually occurs in the second and the third decade where these teeth are supposed to have erupted. Three times more likely to occur in males for unknown reasons. Let's have a look at the radiographic features. As you have seen along with the clinical features, usually they are a unilocular radiolucency which are seen around the crown. So let's have a look at the variations that you can see. In the very first image, you can see there is a tooth which is impacted well within the bone and there will be other two permanent teeth that have erupted. And you have the cyst which is a nice unilocular radiolucency around the crown. Here is another image where the impaction is much more deeper and angulated and the cyst is predominantly on one side of the tooth. Another example here, a larger cyst where you cannot make out the extent of the cyst. So usually they are seen as a unilocular radiolucency. Now this unilocular radiolucency may be a normal phenomenon also. So here on the left hand side you can make out that there is a normal radiolucency seen of an erupting tooth. This is called as a dental follicle. The main differences between a dental follicle and a dental dentigerous cyst is that the size. Usually a dental usually a dental follicle will have radiolucency which ranges from 3 to 4 millimeters. So if you observe the thickness of the radiolucency, it will be just around the tooth. If it is more than 5 millimeter, you generally consider it as a dentigerous cyst. Although histologically, both look similar. So the most important factor is the presence of the cystic lining attached at the cementoenamel junction. And then you should note for the symmetry. So if you look at this particular image, you can see that the Lesion is asymmetric. On the left side of the tooth, there is less amount of cyst. On the right side of the cyst of the tooth, there is more amount of cyst. So basically, the same images, if you can look at the three images here, you can see a very nice pericoronal radiolucency. And here you can see radiolucency predominantly on the distal side of the tooth. And here you can make out that the radiolucency is actually surrounding the tooth. 
is that from the near the apical portion of the root on both the sides. So based upon this distribution, you can divide a dentigral cyst into a central dentigral cyst, a lateral dentigral cyst, or a circumferential dentigral cyst. So a central dentigral cyst is a cyst where you have the crown evenly surrounded by a radiolucency on both the sides, a lateral variety in which the cyst is displaced laterally to one side, a circumferential cyst wherein the cyst is displaced apically and the tooth appears to be floating within the cystic space. Let's have a look at the histological features. When we receive the specimen, usually you have a yellowish colored fluid that is generally aspirated. And grossing is an important step for differentiating dentigerous cyst. A dentigerous cyst will have the tooth within the cystic capsule. So a large cyst which will have an impacted tooth within and when you observe grossly, the epithelial lining will be attached to the cementoenamel junction. This thin watery yellow colored fluid is mainly serum that is exudated. We have to check the epithelium for some nodules because dentigerous like lining is known to have some tumor nodules like adenomatoid odontogenic tumor and amyloblastoma, although rare. The epithelial lining of a dentigerous cyst is usually thin, similar to that of a reduced enamel epithelium. Usually 2 to 3 cell thick and it generally has inactive looking epithelial cells. These are stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium with no rete ridges and also they have occasional mucous metaplasia seen where you will have clear cells within the epithelial lining. When you look at the connective tissue, they are generally non-inflamed, although secondary inflammation can occur. So if you note this connective tissue, you can see a very loosely arranged collagen tissue, which is very similar to that of the dental papilla cells. And they will have a ground substance, which is rich in acidic glycoproteins and mucopolysaccharides. So let's look at what is the origin? They are originating from the reduced enamel epithelial cells. So, the property of the lining is typical of the last stage of an amyloblast, which is the desmolytic stage. In this desmolytic stage, reduced enamel epithelium is helping the tooth to erupt by causing collagenolysis. And this collagenolysis allows the tooth to form a cavity through which it comes into occlusion. A reduced enamel epithelium was earlier attached to the superficial epithelium by a stalk called as the dental lamina, which later on broke down into cell rest of serine. So what we are seeing now is this particular cystic lining and above the cystic lining is the connective tissue. So in this connective tissue, you are bound to see some epithelial cells. So this epithelial cell is what is noted as inactive odontogenic cell rests. So in this image, you can make out there are small angular looking cells. So you need to understand what is the difference between inactive and active odontogenic cells. So if you look at this particular picture here, you can note that the epithelial cells here are tall columnar and these tall columnar cells are not only causing stimulation of the connective tissue to form some eosinophilic material, but they are also having vacuolation within the cells. These are active odontogenic cells. This eosinophilic material that is formed is nothing but an inductive effect noted because of the epithelial mesenchymal interaction. So hence, you should understand that in an dentigerous assist, you do not see this kind of active cell rests. You see an inactive cell rest. 
So if you look at the histology, we will be generally sectioning the tooth, through the tooth we will be sectioning it and we have to note that the epithelial lining that is present is attached to the cemento enamel junction. So this is the epithelium, how it looks like, a very nice flat thin epithelium which can be demonstrated as a small line like this. But when some inflammatory stimulus is hit, this particular epithelial lining becomes chaotic. That's exactly what happens here. So if you see an epithelium here, which is nice and thin flat, when it gets stimulated by inflammation, you see that the epithelium no longer remains normal. It starts proliferating in a haphazard manner and it gives rise to arcs, these curved structures that you know. And these arcs are called as the arcading pattern of cell. These are not only characteristic of, this is a characteristic feature of inflammation and not a characteristic feature of dentigeresis. The name arcading pattern comes from the Roman aqueducts. These are tall structures that were built to carry water from distant areas. So these arc shaped structures are what is demonstrated as arcading pattern in the epithelial lining. Along with these, inflammation can induce the breakdown of the cell epithelium as well as the inflammatory cells giving rise to numerous cholesterol clefts in the connective tissue. The potential complications include the conversion of the cystic epithelium into amyloblastoma, squamous cell carcinoma, also mucopidermoid carcinoma. So let's quickly jump into the treatment portion. Dentigerous cyst is usually small and an enucleation and removal of the impacted tooth can cure the particular ailment. Sometimes you can even remove the cystic lining and allow the tooth to erupt which is usually done for the canine teeth. You can orthodontically place a hook within and pull the tooth to occlusion. In case of a large dentigerous cyst, you may have to do a marsupialization and treat the particular case. In the next part, we will talk about another lesion originating from reduced enamel epithelium which is called as the eruption cyst.